Hey guys, welcome. Yeah, so um, first and foremost, may the Lord Jesus Christ bless this video, bless you and I. And what we're going to do here is we're going to use the delta epsilon limit definition to prove the limit sum property, which is stated here. And videos to come, I will do similar proofs, for example, the limit product property. Now, I have several videos on the delta epsilon limit definition, examples, as well as a thorough introduction, where in that intro video to the delta epsilon limit definition, I talk about it and explain it with laborious detail. So if you need a thorough introduction, watch that video. I'm not going to repeat the things that I said there in that video, yeah? Okay, cool. So let's get on with this proof. So proof, All right? Okay, now according to the delta epsilon limit, limit definition, uh, saying that the limit as x goes to a of f of x is equal to l means that for every epsilon greater than zero, and from here on out, anytime I say epsilon, what you put in your head is an arbitrarily small positive real number. So epsilon is a positive real number as small as we'd like. That's what you keep in your head. But yeah, if the limit is x goes to a of f of x is in fact l, what has to be true is for every epsilon greater than zero, we must find a corresponding delta greater than zero such that a vertical line in math is such that, that's what the meaning of this is, such that for all x, uh, whenever the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, it follows immediately that the absolute value of f of x minus l must be less than epsilon. Now. In the video where I introduced the delta epsilon limit definition, I wanted to make one thing abundantly clear, which is the definition, the delta epsilon limit definition, is an epsilon challenge. What I mean by that is this. You give me an epsilon as small as you'd like, and you've claimed that if this is the y or f of x axis, and this is the x axis, you've claimed that as x goes to a, f of x or y goes to l. Well, it's an epsilon challenge because then you said, oh yeah, is it really true that as x goes to a, f of x goes to l? Well, if that's true, then I give you an epsilon as small as I want. And so then you create what's called an epsilon neighborhood about l. So um, the epsilon neighborhood is an interval from l minus epsilon to l plus epsilon. So that's the challenge. You gave me an epsilon. Now what I have to do is find a delta so that all delta neighborhoods about a, that is the interval from a minus delta to a plus delta, will have all x's in here be mapped into the epsilon neighborhood you specified. And of course the mapping is done through f the function, right? So I have to be able to do that for every epsilon you give me, no matter how small epsilon is. This is crucial to this proof as well as like understanding the delta epsilon uh, limit definition. Okay, cool. Well, since epsilon is just an arbitrarily small positive uh, real number, then for every epsilon greater than zero, I must find a delta greater than zero, blah, 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 so that this is true. That's to say, since epsilon again is a randomly chosen uh, positive small real number, as small as I'd like, I can turn this into epsilon over 2. And if this is true, then this has to be true still. It was epsilon. Now I've changed it to epsilon over 2. Now, um, this is, I, I kid you not, I swear to Jesus, this is my 12th recording of this video because like, well, there are a bunch of reasons to re-record it. I really care about how well delivered my lessons are. But um, other than that, like, right, like I'd get to this stage and like I wanted to explain why I was allowed to change this to epsilon over two. So I tried a substitution. I was basically trying to figure out the best pedagogical approach to getting all of you watching this video to understand why I was able to do this. And ultimately, after going back and forth with a few ideas, I decided that what I'm doing here is the best, right? So we're going to go with this now. If this is true as a translation of this statement, then a similar translation must exist for G, and that similar translation is this. Well, for every epsilon greater than zero, and this epsilon we can say is the same epsilon as this, because, well, epsilon in the end stands for a 
arbitrarily uh, small positive real number. So this is just some really small positive real number. So for every epsilon greater than zero, we must be able to find a delta greater than zero. Now, since f and g are different functions, this delta here may be different from that delta, but we can still say the same epsilons. So I'm gonna say uh, there's a delta two greater than zero uh, such that for all x, for all x, whenever the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta two, it immediately follows that the absolute value of g of x minus m is um, less than um, epsilon over two. Now, why I'm able to write epsilon over two here is the same reason why I was able to write an epsilon over two there. Yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. Now, notice that uh, ultimately, uh, starting from this and this, what we want to get to is saying this. But this translated to a delta epsilon uh, limit definition, that is this here, our end translated would go like this. For every epsilon greater than zero, I'm just telling you where we want to go, where we want to end up. There's a delta uh, greater than zero uh, such that for all x, whenever the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, it immediately follows that the absolute value of f, f of x plus g of x, so f plus g of x minus l plus m, right, is less than epsilon. This is where we want to get to. Okay, cool. Now, we know that this is true, and we know that this is true. So what we're going to do is this. I wish I could just like scoot this up higher. What we're going to do is this. We're going to let delta equal the minimum of um, delta 1 and delta 2. So if delta is the smaller of delta 1 and delta 2, then for every epsilon greater than 0, uh, there's a delta greater than zero, so this delta, which is the minimum of these two, there's this delta greater than zero, such that for all x, whenever this is true, whenever the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, notice that whenever this is true, this is true, and this is true. Why? Because delta is the minimum of these two. So if x minus a an absolute value is less than delta, well, x minus a will an absolute value be less than delta 1, and it will be less than delta 2 because, again, delta is chosen to be the minimum of the two. So it will satisfy both. But if this here, right, and this here are satisfied, then it immediately follows, it immediately follows that um, f of x minus l is less than epsilon and and uh, g of x minus m is less than, uh, and this is epsilon over 2, epsilon, le less than epsilon over 2. So we know that when this is satisfied, this follows, and when this is satisfied, this follows. And what I'm saying is if we choose delta in this way, then uh, this will be met, and this will be met, so both this here all right, which is right here, and um, this here will both follow. All right, okay, so they will both follow based on uh, this premise, right? Right, but then this is where we want to end up, and we can end up here if we know that, if we know that, uh, if we know that from this premise these two things follow. If these two things follow, here's what we can do. Is we can say that since this is true and this is true, that uh, the absolute value of f of x minus l uh, and then plus the absolute value of g of x uh, minus m, we can say that this is less than epsilon because, well, this is less than epsilon over 2, and this is less than epsilon over 2, so their sum must be less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, but epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 is just epsilon. It's 2 epsilon over 2. But wait, right before this, we could have written, we could have written the absolute value of f of x uh, minus uh, l plus g of x uh, minus m and this would have to be a less than or equal to. Why is this true? 
In other words, why can we write this to the left of this? Because of the triangle inequality theorem. In a different video, I show you that the absolute value of a plus b is less or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b. This here is true based on what's called the triangle inequality theorem. And, and again, in a different video, I've already showed you how to prove this triangle inequality theorem. OK, so this here is a, and this here is b. Right? And so um, the absolute value of a plus b must be less or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b. So this here uh, is less or equal to this, and therefore this here is less than epsilon. But this here, right here, right, is just a rearrangement of this statement, right? In other words, um, I don't have space anywhere else, so I must erase here. In other words, what I could have put um, being equal to this here, right? This here is equal to the absolute value of um, f of x plus g of x uh, minus l minus m, right? But this here is equal to the absolute value of um, f of x plus g of x minus l <coughs> minus l plus m, like this, yeah? This here is equal to this here, which is equal to this here, which in turn is less or equal to this here, but this here is less than this, so this here is less than epsilon um, based on this premise. But wait, this right here is exactly this right here. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, if there's such a thing as mathematical syntax, then I think like the last half of how I presented this has bad mathematical syntax. Um, but like, as I said, 12 recordings, enough. I hope you enjoyed. Take care.